Welcome to this episode of Dev Questions with Tim Corey. Join us as we tackle the questions you are asking about a career in software development, understanding the industry, and new technology. Now, here's your host, expert developer, and online educator, Tim Corey. How do I price my software? What's the right price point for the software I'm building so that I make the most money without pricing myself out of the market? This is a great question for today's dev question episode. And I want to dive into how do you get this right? Because it's really tricky. If you set your price too high, no one buys. And if you set your price too low, you don't make any money. So where is that right middle ground where you're not losing money or you're not leaving money on the table? So I'm going to go over some questions to ask to figure out the best price point for you. And then I'm going to go over how I set pricing because I think it's, even though my courses are not software, the, the pricing thoughts that I've gone through are pretty similar to how you'd price software. So you'll see a real world, world example on how I do it. Okay. So the first question to ask yourself is how do you want to be perceived financially? So how do you want your app to look? Do you want it to look? cheap? Do you want it to be premium or do you want it to look free, but not be free like a freemium model? So let's talk through some of these, uh, cheap. Well, a cheap, let's look at the app store, like on your iPhone or your Android device, a cheap app when it's not free is usually a dollar. Okay. So it's, it's a, you know, just 99 cents, just, just enough to charge you something. Whereas a premium app might be $10 or $15, $20 or even more. So what do you want to look at, look like in the market? Okay. Do you want to look like the, um, the throwaway, the cheap, the, you know, um, not expecting much of this, but giving it a shot kind of price, the very, very cheap price. Do you want to look like you are a, a luxury item or a, this is going to be a big deal purchase with, with your app. Or do you want to look at the, the freemium model where you come across at first as free and maybe you are to get started, but then you charge in the back end, whether it is a subscription model or it's remove the ads for money or something like that. It's not just about the money itself. It's about how you want to be perceived because the same application selling at $1 will be perceived differently than if it were selling at $20. So it's not just the money itself. It's the perception that goes along with that. You need to think through. So how do you want to price your, um, your application, but also how do you want your application to be perceived? Okay. And then who is your competition and how are you competing with them? So when you identify your competition and you look at it and say, okay, am I competing on price? Is that where I'm at? Is it based upon features where you say, you know what? Price isn't the real thing here. It's all about the features that I provide that somebody else doesn't, or is it the value you provide? Maybe your application is faster than the other application. Maybe your application allows you, allows the user to do more in less time or allows them to, um, you know, find some other value in your application, may not features it specifically, but just, you know, your features work better. And so there's a value there. It doesn't break as often. So how are you competing there? Are you competing on price? Are you competing on features? Are you competing on value that you provide? So that's the next question to answer. The third question to answer is how are you going to support yourself? This is one that people often don't really understand or don't think through fully. So the first option is a one-time purchase. So you offer an application, people buy it. Well, think through that because you probably need to set your price higher if it's just a one-time purchase. If you're selling your application and you sell it for $20, well, 
that $20 is great revenue when you get it. But then what happens when you have to support that application three years from now, where you've had to support it all along? How much support can you really give before you're not making any money? Because if for every person who buys your application, you on average have one hour of work to do, well, then you're getting paid $20 an hour, which could be okay. But maybe you have your, your uh, timing spikes and now it's two hours or three hours on average per purchase. Well, now you're down to six or $7 an hour is all you're making. And you see how that goes down, or maybe it's just the fact that you have everyone buy up front and then you don't have a, a big trickle of income. Maybe there's only a few people buying over time down the road, and yet you still have to support this application. So a one-time purchase, you have to charge more for up front, knowing that you'll support it longer than you're going to get income from it. Maybe you want an upfront purchase and support. A lot of companies do this. So if you're buying software, let's say you're buying, you know, Telerik or one of those other software vendors, you buy their product, but then you also buy support. So maybe the product is a thousand dollars and then the support is $200 a year. Well, that $200 a year goes to support new versions and upgrades and fixes and all the rest. That residual income can be really helpful to a business. So think that through, is it a one-time purchase or an upfront purchase with support as well? Or the third option is, is it a subscription model? You're saying right up front, this is a software as a service or something similar where you're going to pay annually. So office 365, which is now Microsoft 365, that's a, a concept like that where you pay per year. And I believe it's a hundred dollars a year right now for, uh, I think it's a family plan is a hundred dollars a year. Um, actually a great value because I was used to buying new office products at about $400 and I could use them for as long as I wanted to is a one-time purchase. But with a hundred dollars, I get the new versions as they come out and I get it for my whole family. Yes, I don't own it, but because I'm paying over time, Microsoft can invest more resources into not just making big new versions I have to upgrade to, but in upgrading continually. Well, the same is true for your software. If you have a subscription model, you can continue to invest as it makes sense. When you have 10 users at $10 a month, okay, that's not a ton. It's $100 a month that you're making and maybe you spend a little bit of time on it, but maybe as you grow, you get a thousand users a month. Well, that's $10,000 a month of income. That's a big deal and something can, you can devote more time to, maybe even full-time. Well, now you're able to do a whole lot more knowing you have that continual income coming in. Now, of course, people drop off, but you can look at your rates and see how that works. So that subscription model might work for you. You gotta make sure it works for your customers as well though. Another option is people say, well, I wanna do ads or affiliate revenue. You're not gonna make a ton of money that way, but think that one through and see if maybe that's a, a route you wanna at least consider. And finally, the donation model. Maybe you are just doing this, you know, because you wanna help people out, but you have the ability to have donations. Not a great income stream, definitely not predictable, but it can be at least, you know, something that pays for coffee or pays for um, a new computer or something like that if you get enough of them. So those are some options, things to think through. Um, and that is one of the questions you have to think through. So the three questions that, that I think you should think through are, how do you want to be perceived, especially financially? Who is your competition? How are you competing? And then how are you going to support yourself with this application? Because all three of those will impact how you set your pricing. Now let's talk through what do I do? So I sell courses, but it's a, it's a similar concept. So the first 
thing to think through. How do I want to be perceived? Well, my perception is, is I want to be perceived as providing premium courses with deep value. I'm not competing on the cheapest courses. I'm competing on giving you the resources you need to learn, let's say C-sharp, the easy way, the quick way, and yet the most in-depth way. So it's a premium course offering with deep value. That's the perception I'm looking for. For my competition, a lot of people think that my competition is Udemy or Pluralsight. It's not. I don't perceive them as my competition because I am not competing on the cheapest. I am not competing on having the most. That's what they do. Udemy competes on having $9, $10 courses. That's their competition is the cheapest ones around. And you know what? People buy them and collect them, but they don't actually change their lives because of them. Not at a great percentage. Yes, you can. You absolutely can. By and large though, people don't. They buy it and then go, yeah, I'll put it in the library and then forget about it. Okay. Plural site, people buy that because it's got tons of courses on there and then don't really ever get a lot done with it. That's not what I'm looking for for my students. I'm looking to change your life, change your trajectory of your, your uh, whole career through giving you premium content with deep value. So I'm not competing with Udemy and Pluralsight. I have set my sights on colleges and boot camps. That's who I compete with. I'm looking to give a better education than a college or a boot camp will in the topics I teach. So my foundation courses will give you more value than a college degree or a boot camp will in that subject matter. Okay. That's what I'm focusing on competing with. Now for me support, I really focus on one time purchases primarily. And the reason why is because again, I want to give you deep value. And so I'm focused in on lifetime access, access to the forums, access to, you know, have that experience of not just learning it once and then moving on, not just like you go to college, you get a lecture once. You don't usually get the lecture for life. Okay. You get it once. Same with boot camps. Boot camps are this stream where you have to get in and paddle as hard as you can to keep up all the way to the end. Because if you get, you know, behind in any area, the stream is past you. You're it's, it's gone. You'll not really catch back up very easily. That's not what I want. I want deep value. And so I'm looking at, Hey, you know what? You can learn at your own pace. And then when you're actually doing this at your job, you can refer back to it again, because then you're applying the real world after you've practiced, hopefully. Um, but you're applying the real world. You go, wait, how did Tim do this? And you go back and look at the video again, because it's a long-term resource. That's why I focus on one-time purchases. Now with that, a one-time purchase needs to be higher because the fact that I'm getting a an amount of money up front, and then there is some level of support. I have a full-time support person just for my students. Well, that support has to last for the lifetime of your use, which is years. So that one-time purchase has to be a bit higher. Now, I do have a subscription model as well, and that does benefit my company because it allows me to have some stable income and not be fighting for, you know, uh, the next thing or the next sale to bring in a, a chunk of money and have this up and down, uh, income stream that, uh, subscription model does help with the, um, the stability of the income. And I do have some focus on that, but primarily I'm looking at that long-term value, uh, the one-time purchase. Now for my pricing, I encourage you to value the purchase. So when you purchase something for a hundred dollars, you value it. When you purchase something for $10, often you throw it in your collection and you say, oh, I'm going to collect that course. You don't get the value out of it. I don't want you to put my courses in a collection. 
I don't want you to collect all my courses unless you're going to go through them all. And I want you to do it one at a time. Don't just buy all front and, and hope that you get to it. Buy them one at a time and go through them because I want you to get that deep value. I am encouraging that with my pricing. It also, because of how I set my pricing, it supports growth. You see, I am not looking to just do things on volume. Volume for me is actually not a good thing because the higher my volume is, the more time it takes to support my paying students. And I really try hard to support them as much as I can, which is why I hired Tom. Tom is my community manager and he spends his whole day focused on the community, helping them, answering questions, helping with invoices, working with refunds and all the rest of the stuff that goes on with the community. Well, that's expensive. And the more I have students wise, the more time it takes from his day and the less time you can do other things with his time and with my time. So I need to set the price at a point that supports growth because with that support of growth, also that allows me to do more free content. I've set my price lower and tried it out. I even tried a Udemy course. And what I found was it actually took away from the company instead of adding to the company. And so we actually shrunk a little bit because of that lack of income. The volume didn't make up for the, the lack of income. So my pricing I set to support growth and that supports for me, more free content that I can do. So for me, I jealously guard that pricing and I don't just lower it uh, whenever I feel like because of the fact that while I love to give everyone all of my premium content, what that would do is it would take away from my ability to provide more free content. So I say, no, I'm not gonna lower my prices because in doing so, I will hurt the user who can't pay. So that's how I set my pricing. That's how I think through those questions and how I apply it to what I do. So if you follow a similar pattern, not the same answers to the questions, but that similar pattern of asking those questions and answering them for yourself, I think it'll be much easier to come up with a pricing model that works best for your specific situation. All right, thanks for listening to this week's episode of Dev Questions. If you have a question about being a developer, check out the archive of this podcast and see if I've already answered it. And if not, go to I am Tim Corey and go to the podcast page. There's a form there you can fill out to ask your question. And hopefully you'll see on a future episode of Dev Questions. Have a great day. And as always, I am Tim Corey.